25 years away from it and being in the corporate uh, world for that amount of time, it's sort of very new to get back into like the art um, industry for sure. Hello and welcome to the podcast, a living library of resiliency, creative conversations and artist series. So happy that you joined us today. I have um, a great guest and a great special uh, guest co-host, and we had a wonderful conversation with Stephen Ray. His creativity is a blessing. Stephen has always possessed a creative spark and an artist's soul. After years of working in the corporate retail world, it wasn't until after the support of family and the encouragement of his niece that he learned to embrace his true calling. He is now entering his first year of art school, reflecting on his undiagnosed ADHD battles with anxiety and depression. He sees new possibilities to work in a style that's uniquely him. He captures value and depth in each piece, and Stephen gives back to the community. He is a non-traditional style and is diverse and bold with his color application. Stephen spotlights social injustices and shares his struggles with ADHD while celebrating the strengths of the people who inspire him most with us. A little bit about Stephen Ray. You can find him on Instagram at fineartpro underscore Jex. And he is a local artist in Oakville, Ontario with a passion for storytelling and he creates with the objective of uplifting and providing encouragement in life and tackling the challenges of today's societies in the areas of social equality. So my very special uh, guest co-host for this podcast was Steve Wilson. Uh, he is an artist, teacher, juror, and gallery owner of Steve Wilson Studios and Gallery located at 4452 Queen Street, Niagara Falls, Ontario, in the downtown and cultural area. Uh, He is an elected member of the Ontario Society of Artists and served on the board from 2018 to 2019. He's an elected member of and previous director of exhibitions for the Society of Canadian Artists and an elected member of the Color and Form Society. He was on the board of directors of the Bow Arts Brampton from 2003 to 2007, serving as president in those last two years, and previously uh, was the vice president of the Mississauga Art Society. He co-juried um, the second annual Wildlife Nature and Nature Show at the Bow Arts in 2010 with international artists. Um, He's shown all across Canada, the United States, England, Tasmania, and Turkey, and his work can be found in many private collections. And he's won several awards as well. So some of those awards most recently were the second place in the Federation of Canadian Artists in Vancouver Salon Exhibition 2021, and fifth place in the uh, the Fusion Art Online Competition Cityscape 2019 against entries from all around the world. Yeah, I would think uh, the Queen Elizabeth Cultural Center in Oakville would be interested in that type of um, a show. Yeah, the Queen Elizabeth Cultural uh, Center Community Center is actually a five minute walk from uh, where I am type idea. Mm, so convenient. Uh, very close. Yeah, yeah, very close. Um, they haven't had a lot going on with the, the, the pandemic. Um, yeah. So yeah, they would definitely be one. And um, I'm involved with uh, getting back into my art stuff. I did quite a few courses through uh, the Dundas Valley Art uh, School. Um, right. So um, there's been some um, actually in a photography course right now, we're sort of looking to possibly pitch um, installs of the series is that we're working on uh, as ways to, to show those those pieces. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting when you uh, talk or ask that question, because a lot of my art has generally been around, um, I would say, uh, like philanthropy, a lot of it's given away. I've done some stuff with the Terry Fox Foundation where I create pieces. Um, I do uh, some things with, I did a couple pieces with uh, Save Us a Palton, which is uh, for a ladies um, abuse group. Um, and that was something where 
uh, we did a piece um, and money was raised. So I don't have a tendency, maybe a lot of times to sell right now for a profit, but more so for like fundraising type uh, abilities type idea for sure. Nice. So Stephen, I'm wondering, um, yep. what were you like in high school? Did you know you were creative then? And what were your experiences with art and uh, creating art? Yeah, so I, I would say in high school and from a very like young age, I, I was very, I would describe myself as very creative in, in school. So I leaned towards, uh, you know, when I got to high school, I leaned towards uh, the art side of, of programs when I got into the this is dating myself back, right? This is when you had like OAC and five years of high school. But uh, once you could start picking your courses, I, I leaned uh, towards um, the arts um, a lot. So in the visual arts, um, a lot of my English classes were around, if I had opportunity, things that were more involved in like creative writing um, and such. So I was very like sort of much in the arts, but I, I wasn't necessarily a, um, a very confident kid back back then right so um i did arts but i still you know played a lot of sports um you know you date back that that long um you know arts was sometimes you know difficult to 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 be in if you weren't a jock within school sometimes you got picked on i used uh, my athletics sort of to minimize what i would feel like getting picked on and um, so yeah very creative and then when i finished high school that was sort of uh um, a different, different, different story in the path that I, that I took. Yeah. And you went to college. What did you take in college? Or no, you went yeah, to so when I finished right? up, I thought a lot about, yeah, I, I did college. I did two years of, of college. Um, but I never followed sort of my passion of, of the arts. It wasn't super, um, confident um in it at the at the time not confident in my art ability but just confident as an individual and um i was never really a very um i worked very hard at my academics but it never turned over in regards to to marks right so cognitive confidence and what could i get through school and do and um and and pass and we can talk about it a little bit uh, later but um you know, finding up much later in life, just being diagnosed with ADHD as an adult and realizing, uh, you know, what implications that had with school. So I went to college for two years for recreation and leisure. And um, I did did that and came on graduate and went sort of straight into the recreation and leisure type industry. Um, and then uh, the corporate world of corporate retail for around 12 years. Um, and actually really started changing. I have a, a niece, um, who's 18 now, who's going off to, to, to uh, university pre ironic. She's going into her first year and her, her uncle 30 years older is going back into his first year of school. But um, she always encouraged me to, to do art. Um, and a couple of years ago, she gave me a sketch pad and uh, some markers and um, encouraged me to do it and said to me like, you know, Uncle Steve, like when you do stuff, I want to want to see it. So I started, you know, creating just with, you know, uh, pencil and sketch and that sort of evolved and um, sort of found my groove and my sort of art that I, I do now and at around the same time picked up uh, my photography. Um, yeah, and that's sort of how it sort of, uh, yeah, came about. And now I really lean towards like the arts and, and changing what I'm going to do career path and I'm sort of out of the, the corporate corporate world full time now. So do you have a preference in your arts, whether it's um markers, et cetera, or the photography end of it? Um, it, no, I like, I enjoy both, both very, very much. Um, you know, uh, I do a lot of like ink marker, charcoal, acrylic paint. I have a tendency to sort of, uh, uh, mix mediums together. Or even lately I've experienced or experimented with sort of, you know, creating an art piece, um, and then photographing it and then taking a photograph and, a double exposure and it overlaying it to to create sort of print type stuff. Um, I enjoy I enjoy both. Um, photography is much more um, natural for me sometimes to create um, sometimes connection or value in just because of you know how it works. You're you're looking through a lens and something um, uh, 
2D and when you snap it, it, it creates that value automatically um, because I didn't have a lot of experience as an artist working um, with still life and I do a lot of people sometimes um, you know that creates the the challenge for for me of creating um, value or depth and emotion in something right because if you take something from a, a 2d image and recreate it um, to bring life to it it can sometimes be um, challenging so I enjoy both really um, but my natural for composition and and uh, creating value within my work is probably more naturally within photography than it would be actual um, um, art. Oh, okay, because sure. when I was looking on your Instagram site, your photography, yeah. your black and white seems to have more of a somber feel to it where the color seems to be more celebratory. I don't know if that's yeah. just my take on it or is that something you're trying to portray? Yeah, no, I would, I would say with my photography, I'm very like, um, old school in regards to um i like to create connection through black and white so almost everything i do in photography is is monochromatic and shot like it was film even if it is on digital um and i'm very old school in regards to you know i don't like um, post editing or post work right so you know my piece has to be very close to uh what the final piece is when when i take it uh, most of the stuff that you would see in color on my Instagram page are generally photo shots of um, my artwork. Um, but I, I would say, yeah, I'm trying to, with my black and white, I've, I've been given that um, sort of a somber or um, that emotional like vacancy maybe through like my mental health connection that I find by working in the black and, and white. Yeah. Um, and then in my artwork generally, um, you know, um, colored sort of to try and, uh, you know, uh, bring life to things. So yeah, yeah, that's very yeah, you, yeah. You're right on, sort of with that and how I approach like that that stuff and how I take my photographs for sure. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? So your photography is is pretty somber and reflects your mental health challenges. Yeah. And your marker portraits are a celebration of these individuals. Yeah, I think uh, you know when I first started getting into my art and I do a lot of you know. Um, you know, portrait type things. I do a lot of sometimes thing of individuals that I find to be influential in, in history and such. Um, you know, I really tried to use my art when I was creating from a standpoint of um, positivity around mental health and, and how I sort of dealt with it, right? I, um, I'd be very, you know, I'd be very easy as an individual to look at a social equality or social justice issue um, and find in it maybe the things that, um, I don't know, piss me off or, or tick me off about those things, right? Um, and it would be very easy to create what might be considered, um, you know, a negative piece or something that could really um, stir up the emotion of, you um, the individual who's in disagreement to it, right? So who's not of, of that side. Um, I was encouraged a lot by my wife to try very hard to uh, spin my art into something that was, you know, more positive, more uplifting. So that came through color and more along the lines of, um, it, you know, is it better to create a piece that might tick off a hundred people to a hundred people on the other side of the aisle that don't agree with what I'm trying to say? Or would it be more uplifting for someone who was on the front lines of that particular issue to be uplifted? Um, and so that's where the color comes from. And that's where sort of the positivity um, comes from. I, you know, I'd rather impact one person and encourage them than tick off a hundred people that might be not happy with like what I'm trying to portray type idea, right? So, yeah. All right. Yeah, it's always good to try to um, elicit some type of um, a response from people. Doing it in a positive way, it really has more of an impact, I find, um, because when you start challenging somebody in a negative way, they get their back up and they shut right down. They don't even try to understand your message. And in a positive way, people are more open to it, which is, you know, I find that's a lot better approach to art. For myself yeah yeah I, I i found that uh for for sure and the other thing that really helped me to do is along with my you know um 
you know, challenges or understanding of ADHD. It, for me, it, I'm an individual that when I'm passionate about something, it's very easy for me to go, you know, zero to 150, right? Like the yeah. gas just hit the bottom of the pedal and, um, you know, sometimes maybe say things in a, in a point of, of view that could be, if, if slowed down, could be that much more um, impactful if, if you just took time to say them. So by putting that positive spin on the art, it allows me to, you know, like slow down um, with something, right? So, I, I, you know, given, given uh, an example, you know, it would be very easy if it was a political issue and I was, um, uh, upset with a maybe a political party or political leader to quickly create a, a a piece that showed my disdain in that you know particular individual um or is it better to take time understand what the issue really is about um and then not concentrate on that negativity of, of that but on the positivity of of the other individual on the on the other side of of, of the aisle type idea right so um, yeah, it's helped a, a lot for for that. Just in me um, doing that from a from an ADHD standpoint, just to really like like slow down for 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 sure. Um, yeah, I find that very interesting because one of the when you think of ADHD, first off, you think of it as a childhood sort of issue, right? Mm -hmm. But when you think of it overall, you think of impulsivity. And um, just like uh, quickly jumping to an idea, to an idea. And the fact that you're slowing down to, um, yeah. it seems like you've done a lot of work on yourself once you got the diagnosis. Um, can you tell, tell me about when you got the diagnosis and um, how you sort of found out that you were ADHD? Yeah, sure. So... Uh, my diagnosis is, is is pretty new. It's within uh, sort of um, I would say the last eighteen to 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 twenty months, um, and it really came about because um, you know all through my twenties and and my thirties um, there was always this sort of thing of you know anxiety and a little bit of depression, but I always controlled those things through you know, other things that I, I did, you know, a lot of like, you know, physical activity. I used to be a very like avid runner. Um, so I used to do a lot of these things that um, sort of kept, you know, those things at, at bay. And then as things started to slow down, I didn't do those things as much. Um, my anxiety and my depression sort of, you know, manifested. Um, and in 2018, I actually, you know, took this, this step as an adult to sort of admit myself to um, the outpatient program at uh, Oakville Trafalgar. I was just one day at home and, and called my wife and said, like, I need to go to the hospital and, um, you know, I need to, to, you know, treat this more seriously. Um, and so as, as we got through that, you know, um, you know, I'll give credit to my, you know, wife. She, you know, did a lot of reading, a lot of research and like you talked about ADHD is, can be very um, impulsive uh, behaviors. And there was a lot of impulsivity that I had in my, in my life that uh, I used to um, trigger off the depression. Um, and, it, you know, I won't go into too many details because I'm not like super comfortable on all those things, but you know, one thing would be like spending, right? Very impulsive would spend money on things that I didn't need to. And um, I'd done a lot of therapy and a lot of uh, counseling and we just decide, well, why don't we go down the route of cognitive therapy and just like get a diagnosis and see there's too many things on the list that, that, you know, that cross over and um, went through a cognitive test and, you know, wound up finding out that, you know, this is where, I, where I was very, very challenging to do as an adult, right? Because in, in a lot of cases, um, you know, it's usually, it, it's not something that you um, manifest over time or, or um, get ADHD, right? As an adult, right? You would have had it as a child before you're in your adult, before your adolescence, right? So yeah, oh, that's true. That, right? so, so yeah, in your in your work in your in your work that you were doing on yourself, you were probably looking back at a lot of different incidents in in your life and having to come face to face with those. And you're probably still it's fairly new, right? So it is it's a hard process. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. It's a challenging process for, for sure. Right. I think the biggest thing like getting diagnosed as an adult is, you know, I can't go back and say, regret the last 25 years of my life. Right. There's a part of me that says, you know, wow, what, what would have happened if I was, you know, diagnosed as a kid? What, you know, what would have that done for me for my schooling? What would have that done for me in my education? Would I have been more confident to follow uh, the arts when I was younger? Uh, but I have to believe that, you know, sort of the path that my life took me is for a particular, you know, um, reason. Um, and so you can't live with re regrets um, and you just sort of have to press on. Um, but, you know, going through that, it's interesting, um, currently applying to go back to school as I got my transcripts and I resubmitted my transcripts as a high school student and I opened them up after 25 years and you looked at the marks and you reflect back and go, I wasn't a kid that skipped class. I studied as hard as I could. Um, you know, I worked hard at my academics as best I could, but then to look and be like, wow, look how many 50, 53s that I just squeaked by. How many like just low C's did I have? You know, I, I excelled in, in art and English as I got later um, in, in high school where it was more creative and they were higher marks. Um, and I look back and, you know, it just sort of shows you because it, it, it would have been like, how did this get missed back then, right? You weren't like that trouble type kid or you weren't that kid that skipped classes. Um, and here was, if you didn't have advocacy or I came from a time where um, unless you were, you know, someone with ADHD and a kid, kid that was like really like twitchy in class or caused problems, like you weren't going to get diagnosed right and yeah. you just sort of knocked it off as as creativity but that's yeah, a real eye opener i look at my marks and go like how the heck how the heck you know did i get through high school number one and how the heck did it not get addressed back then when you sort of look at what those what those marks were for sure but it is like a like i said in my questions that i sent into you guys uh, in prelim sort of discussion about this uh, my adhd is a blessing though from a creativity standpoint right it, it allows me to sort of think outside the box um, with my photography i'm very much uh, a photographer that shoots on the fly right so i don't preset compositions i don't you know preset things like um, in a street setting right it's sort of walking down the street and if i'm doing street photography it just sort of hey there's my composition and it just fits just like really quickly sometimes they work out sometimes they don't but that sort of really quick thinking and creativity from the ADHD allows you to, to do that. Whereas, you know, maybe some photographers, you know, might have to sit on a particular street corner for two or three times just to get a feel for what type of shot they want. Whereas, you know, I could walk down the street and hit a street corner and be like, wow, that looks interesting. Let me put up my lens to this and boom, set up a composition and, and sort of, you know, fire away with a, with a shot or two. Right. Yeah, it leaves room for a lot of original creativity, ADHD. Yeah, yeah. yeah, for sure. And generating a lot of new ideas rather than working within the bounds of older ideas. So yeah, yeah, I think yeah, I think that's you know part of it as as well, right? You think a little bit, um, you know, outside of, of of the box. You may be not necessarily like fully, um, you know, traditional and 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 what your approach is to to uh, do, right? I've taken a few art classes um, where, um, you know, might be doing a painting cl class on um, portraits, um, you know, and I have to, you know, say to my instructor, you know, here's what we're trying to achieve in regards to value at the end, or here's maybe what the, um, how it's supposed to look, but I might have to get there in a reverse mode, right? I, I can't follow necessarily the A, B, C, and D rules. I want to, I want to know how to create value. I want to know how to mix colors, but I might not be the guy that can mix them on a palette. I need to mix it on a canvas and I need to do it that way. Um, or um, you're doing a portrait and I might need to start from the bottom and work the way up, you know, instead of the traditional like three circles and stuff like that, right? But they're all values to, to, to have, right? But you get there in your own sort of, sort of way, for sure. Yeah, it sounds a little familiar. I'm sort of the same way. Self-taught, out of the box. I try things. I don't really plan them out. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a cool way to to do it. I find right because I just, I just find a lot of times by doing that I can connect so much more, um, you know, with my um, emotions in my in my pieces. Right, I don't get too technically, um, you know, caught down. But at the same time, as an artist, I'm I'm very much in awe of the individual or, or artist that is is very technical in their in their work. Right, it's just something to realizing that, you know, I have, I have a good friend, not a good, a good friend from when I was a, a kid who, who works out in BC now, and we, you know, trade art back and forth. And um, he's very much a very, here's 35 hours on a piece of work. And when it's done, it looks like a photograph, right? And I'm very much a little bit more on the abstract realism. You're going to know who, who I'm, um, looking to portray, but it's not going to be like fully realistic in, in my pieces. And um, we have conversations back and forth and I'll say, Hey, hey Curtis, man, like I am, you know, so envious that, you know, that you're able to do that. I can't, I can't sit down and spend 30 hours with like this detail to make it look like a photograph. Um, but in reverse, you know, he'll come back to me and said like, but if you, if you gave me a paintbrush or you gave me markers and asked me to create something, in a couple hours in, in this style, I couldn't do that, right? So it, it, I think it's very important to, to be open to like everybody's style of art and appreciate, you know, what it is and, and where it comes from for sure. Mm -hmm. Art art in the uh, creative process is very personal to everybody. Everybody has something to offer, which is really great. And when I look at some of your work, it is raw, it is just down on the canvas, but it is identifiable and, um, Quite interesting to view so yeah Thanks. very good for love your work thank you very much yeah. that's a big compliment coming from steve because steve was an art teacher correct steve i did have some classes i i wasn't a proper teacher though no but i did hold some classes and and steve's work is amazing as well you can see some of it behind him that piece you have up behind you right now um, yeah. I believe you posted that on social media today. It's amazing. It reminds me of up north of where I grew up, yeah, really yeah. on Lake Superior. It, where, where is that from? It's actually Killarney, oh, okay. Killarney yeah, Provincial Killarney, Park. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, so I'm, a, yeah. I'm more like your friend where, you know, I can appreciate all types of art. I more portray uh, realism, but I am trying to loosen up more myself and trying to uh, not be as strict with myself. It's really a challenge for me and it's something it's out of my comfort zone. So yeah, it's um, really interesting to see how people work and uh, try to understand what they're communicating. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting, um, you know, thing for, for, um, for sure, right? That every, like you said, Steve, everybody has their own style. And I look at you, your piece, and I, I checked out your your gallery and stuff, and I look at the piece of it that we're talking about right right now. Um, um, but you know, for me, as like the artist that works the other way, right? Like I will always be in, in awe of work like that, right? Because um, I still see an emotional connection um, that you've created with that particular landscape, right? And so. Um, it, it's very powerful to see that it can be done in, in, in multiple ways. And I, and I always think that, you know, I try and look at other artists like yourself, Steve, if I was looking at your piece and, and what can I take from that? I may not be as realistic in my approach, but, um, you know, the use of color or the use of composition, um, you know, you can always learn from, from one another for sure. So, um, like I said, yeah, I'm always envious of, of that because I know I, man, I couldn't, I couldn't sit down and, and do that much um, yeah. detail in, in something and create the same emotional uh, connection, um, which, uh, you know, we stand in awe for sure, yeah. Yeah, I think we're kind of the same because we both try to convey a feeling or a story in one frame. And yeah, um, yeah it's very interesting. Uh, yeah, some of my pieces um, I try to tackle, like you said, a social issue, but in a positive way, and never a negative. And uh, yeah, I respect you for that as well. Yeah, you just completed one on the um, Highway of Tears. Yeah. It was, it was beautiful, actually. It's. Uh, did you get to yeah. see that one, Stephen? On his. Did you, did you Did you find that when you were looking on his social media? 
it's fairly new. Yeah, it's an in, in uh, indigenous yeah, I piece. That. I, saw that as yeah. well. I, found, I found I thought it was like very good. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. I think oh, that's okay. uh, that, like very you know cool, cool to see and very very powerful to to um, to see and I, you know, as an artist standpoint, you know, I, I, you know, I, yeah. I was, you know, challenged with like things around social equality and social um, issues in regards to an artist, you know, what, you know, what, what can you portray and what can't you portray if you don't, you know, necessarily have, um, you know, um, a connection, connection to it, to it personally. And, uh, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I know an artist, uh, Nadia Lloyd, I don't know if you guys have heard of her. She's uh, an artist out of Toronto and uh, um, she creates masks during the pandemic. She's a, the artist that created the, the Black Lives Matter masks that the Raptors wore as a uh, first year of the pandemic. And I remember her asking her one time, I was looking to, you know, portray a, a particular piece and saying, you know, am I able to do this as, as an artist? Am I able as um, a white male artist to portray uh, an issue around Black Lives Matter. And uh, I remember her saying to me as art, saying like, as artists, you know, um, it's important to portray what, what you see and, and tackle those issues as long as you're willing to be open to learn about them and learn learn from them, right? Um, rather than pigeonhole and, and, and say that you, you, you can't create to that. So she was very uh, encouraging for me on certain pieces to, to do, um, I, I, you know, I'm very particular though, if I'm, I'm trying to tackle something um, and I don't fully maybe understand it and, and doing some research or connecting with someone in the community or who might know to, to bounce ideas off them or to ask yeah. questions to, you know, fully understand it before putting, putting something out there. But, um, you know, I think um, the spirit of the artist, um, you know, can portray a, a lot of, a lot of things and, um, you know, just to put, you know, as artists just put blinders on and not look at necessarily like, um, you know, who's creating it, but what what the final piece is, is, is uh, you know, super important for sure. Yeah, as an artist, you got to be sensitive. Um, it, there's a fine line nowadays with yeah. my, um, my piece, the um, Highway of Tears, Sky Quay, who the main figure in the piece she was the one that talked me into doing it. Uh, she said I had to do it um, because it had to be more realistic and she paints more traditional. Right. Um, so we had quite a few conversations before I even started that piece. But yeah, you, sensitivity is very, um, you've got to have that when you're, you're doing a piece. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. there's two different, like I know we were talking about that. See, there's like always two different approaches to it, right? We've had this conversation before is like, uh, with other artists is like, are you creating a, a piece that um, you are trying to, you know, portray a image or a message to the masses and a bunch of people that have to like, or are you portraying or creating a piece that is just something for, for your, for yourself, right? And, um, you know, um, I think about sometimes create, you know, piece of photography, right? And at the end, mm -hmm. um, you know, someone could critique it and not see the same things in it that you look to por por portray, uh, but you can still be fully fulfilled with it as, a, as an artistic creator that, hey, I'm, I'm happy with it if just myself likes it, right, on, on this particular occasion, right? So, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree. I took on um, the topic of truth and reconciliation hesitantly, um, but for me, it's something that's very um, dear to my heart and very emotional as well. All everything that's been going on through the news, I've had a like a full spectrum of emotions from, you know, anger to just frustration, and um, happy that now it's being spoken about in in such a wide way. But about two years ago, um, I, I did want to create something for a long time, but I was so hesitant. Um, and then a call came out of the Fort Erie Native Center that was calling all artists to submit and I took it as an opportunity because I felt welcomed. So that's another thing too is like if you don't like if you don't feel welcome to to participate sometimes you're not going to jump in with both feet even though you want to even though you might not fully understand what's going on but I was really happy with what I created and then um 
a call came out of the city of St. Catharines for a similar call for Truth and Rec, and I submitted it there and it ended up being um, in the mayor's juried art exhibit and they chose it as the piece that they used to do all the promotions with so I was so flattered but scared at the same time like am I the right person to be are you, are you guys sure I kept right, thinking to right. myself um, but it was because I it was created it was soul driven it was from my heart and uh, it was portrayed in that way and um, I just picked it up this week I brought it back um, and I did a little happy video that I got it back because I hadn't seen it in forever and I had two offers on it and I decided not to sell and it's hanging on my wall now. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. That, 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 yeah, that's sometimes like very like, uh, you know, um, you know, important as, uh, as an artist, right. That sometimes you create, you know, create things. Um, you know, you talk about that. I have like a, a piece that's in my room here, like on, on my desk that I did of, um, John Coltrane um, and uh, gave it to my dad on his 91st this last January, who, who recently just passed a couple of months ago. And um, my mom gave it, you know, back to me to allow me to, to keep it. And I have it here in the, in the room. And, you know, I've had some people like to my Instagram say, Hey, that's a pretty cool piece. Would you ever do prints of it type idea? And, you know, even though I have offers, it'll be one piece that like I would I would never do a print of. It's just going to be like one original that's framed and signed and named by myself and all that sort of went to my dad and, you know, wouldn't matter if, you know, 100 people want it or 10 people want it. It's just going to be one piece that just never goes anywhere because it has that certain certain con yeah certain connection. Yeah, and I, I know um, we were matched up when around the time that your father passed away. So yeah. it was a um, an interesting uh, time to be in contact with you back and forth as you were creating throughout it even. And some really nice stuff came out. But I love that John Coltrane one. That one was really yeah. cool. Um, yeah. I remember thinking, I'm going to ask him if I can buy that, but I guess I can't <laughs> now. No, 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 no. Um, yeah, but it's it sometimes like, hey, that's, you know, the cool thing that is about an artist when you have like a certain, you know, connection to, uh, to something and when you, um, you know, create it, right? Um, there, you know, there, there's sometimes, you know, to, uh, I, you know, I think back like a year ago, I did something for Terry Fox Foundation um, and uh, decided to do it. Um, put it up a couple prints, you know, there are my prints that I've sold the most of that were like through an auction piece that were just proactive to run for, for Terry, Terry Fox. Right. And, um, you can sometimes sit, <clears throat> sit back and go, I mean, you have the rights to all those things and you created like a donational piece to, to do, and you can look at it and be like, wow, these are the, these are the two pieces that, you know, you know, raise this amount of money, which is great. And this is what people pay for it type idea. And, um, you know, as an artist, you're, you're still going to be um, uh, loyal. It's not the right word, but you're still going to have that um, feeling as artists that it, it doesn't go to market to, to sell after the fact when you could, even if people were like interested in it, right? So there's always that sort of uh, thing there that you have for sure. So what are you creating now? Uh, so right now I'm actually, uh, doing a couple things. I, um, creating, um, another piece that I'm going to do for Terry Fox for, for this year. So I started on the prelim for, for that. That's going to be, um, uh, an auction auction piece and, um, looking to, um, you know, very interesting sort of like approach to it. And, you know, I've been very, um, lucky that with the Terry Fox Foundation in, in Oakville and is run by Pam Dam, Damworth, uh, which is the, the liberal um, MP for, for the riding. But even with that, she's given me full creative um, uh, creativity to approach as, as I want. And I, I went to her this year and, you know, we have everything that's going on with, you know, reconciliation and, you know, um, indigenous, um, you know, we have, um, you know, the, um, challenges of the the Muslim community and what happened in in London and you know and I said to her I said you know I'd like to approach this as you know different this year like it's about you know Terry Fox and the Terry Fox Foundation but I believe 
you know, Terry's message of, of hope was more than just necessary raising money for cancer, right? His message of hope was to fight on for many things, right? And so, you know, the approach around that this year is that, you know, Terry Fox would normally be like a piece that was in Canadian colors and, you know, I'm looking to approach it in, in, in colors that are unification colors and, and colors that sort of um, address that and looking to see if I can get the running community involved in, in Oakville and um, do some shots and do a double layering piece with some like runners within the Oakville community that follow. So that's that's uh, one thing that I'm working on. Um, another thing I'm working on currently right now is I'm, you know, working on you know two series of of um, for photography. One's um, uh, like a four picture series of um, the LBGTQ community um, and the whole thought process um, behind that series is four images. Um, small getting larger uh, with the sort of smallest piece being where you would um, maybe expect there to be support for the LBGT community and then the largest piece being the most impactful somewhere that was maybe obscure you wouldn't think there would be support for for that maybe out of a smaller community or something like that so that's one and then the second series working on is just music within the pandemic um, and just uh um, documenting uh, music venues, not large venues, um, but smaller venues and how they've been impacted through um, uh, the pandemic. Um, and the whole thought process behind there is, you know, um, eight images, you know, one black and white image of an image that was impacted and, and has unfortunately had to close or is no longer because of the pandemic, but uh, one that has uh, been able to sur survive and so those are the sort of the main things that I'm um, uh, working on uh, right now. And my other big one, which I'm a little nervous to do, is I'm actually working on a, a piece of um, Simon Ward for the Strombellas and have been sort of going back and forth with them and doing a, a portrait of, of Simon and his uh, um, outward talking about uh, mental health. Um, so, you know, that's one piece that I'm sort of doing for... Um, you know, uh, myself and um, going back and forth and updating the band with it and showing. And, you know, the hope is at the end, just sort of, you know, being a positive piece in, in my own way. And, you know, maybe it's something that, you know, he'll want to, to take or the band will want to take that they can just hang in their studio or something. Um, so those are the things that I'm working on right now. Are you looking forward to going back to school for photography? Um, or is it yeah, kind of uh, frightening? <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's a mix. Um, it's, a, mm. it's exciting to go back and do something in the arts that I've always wanted to do that never wanted to do. So there's that excitement that way. There's mm -hmm. the excitement also of um, now that where I know I am in life and from an uh, educational standpoint and understanding my ADHD to be able to approach school in a, in a in a way that I can be successful at um, type idea. Not to say I wasn't successful before, but um, what would be the potential if I'm actually learning in the way that that I that I can type idea? Uh, so I'm you know I'm excited that way to um, do it. You know, am I a little nervous? Sure, 47 yeah. going back to to yeah. school. Not so much that I don't think I'd necessarily would fit in because I'm a pretty easygoing guy. Um, um, but you know, um, you get, so this is in person, this is in uh, person this, full time or online. Yeah, it's full, no, it's full time, full time, two year di diploma, um, with the pandemic, I believe for the fall, it's a, it's a combination. We're only in class for classes that we have to be in and lectures we would, would be, mm -hmm. uh, from home, um, type idea. Um, but yeah, as you, you know, become an adult and you have, you know, um, family and you have, um, different things that you do, those are also big sort of um, risks that you, not yeah. risks that you take, right? They can be risk reward, right? But yeah, you're, mm -hmm. you're walking away from something that you currently do to, you know, take two years out of, uh, not take two years, take, take two years to explore something in, in your life and to not know necessarily, you know, where it, where it comes when you come out. I do know when I come out, I don't want to be a commercial photographer. I don't want to to do do that i want to use like my photography for more of a fine art space and um you know 
and I, I don't know where that will be. I don't know if that will be, you know, working with, you know, agencies on my own term, or it'll be working with small business or nonprofits and creating, um, you know, more educational and photojournalism pieces. I try not to look that far down, far down the line with it. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, it, it's mixed. It's exciting though. It's yeah. But it was hard to new, pull the trigger. A lot yeah, of back and venture. forth to go. Yeah. Hard, a lot of hard back and forth, right? Like, you know, can I do this? I remember what school was like before, you know, I don't want it to be like that. Okay. Can I be confident in what I know about myself now and, and take it in, in this way? And um, uh, I'm very, I'm very blessed that, that I, within my family and my wife, that I have someone that's very supportive to um, encourage me to do that. Um, mm-hmm. You know, one of, you know, you know, since I got accepted and saying myself, one of the, probably the most um, meaningful messages I got back was actually like from my brother, right? I sent him a message just saying, hey, decided to go back to school. I'm doing like photography. I'm going back for two years. Um, and he sent me a message, just a quick message back, but, you know, saying congrats. That's like amazing. And this is coming from my brother who's more of a not artsy type guy who's a police officer who's very much a different sort of type of personality but to see that sort of excitement from me is probably like one of the best messages that I've got back since I've like sort of you know decided to to go mm-hmm. for sure yeah yeah it's really good that you have a supportive wife that's backing you on this one as, as well yeah like I said right she's been very um instrumental in regards to me you know being on the on the on this path, right? You know, we're we're both like different. I'm very artistic, creative. Um, you know, she's m- more um, analytical, numbers type uh, person. But uh, because of that, you know, analytical and studying and research, she's the one that sort of came across from some readings and said, "Hey, like, look at all these things, Steve. We have, you know, here's these ten things, and seven of these things that." we've been challenged with um, uh, over the years um, fall onto this list and cross off why don't we go down this approach and see if this actually what it what it is and um, and I just said it there we like that's such an important thing I find like from a mental health standpoint right um, we always approach it as like we we're in it together she's standing there yeah. by my side you know there's days that are good days and there are days that are bad days but you know she says it's we and we're a family and we're in it together you know it can be in a lot of situations where it's an I you're like sort of on your own right and that's a that's a big yeah. um, resource and encouraging tool to have when you're um, you know um, challenged or going through any of any of those things for sure. Mm-hmm. Do you find a lot of your family and friends are supportive or do they not quite understand the artistic you versus the corporate you? Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm grateful in regards to my close friends um, that I've been open with that have been very supportive of, um, you know, my mental health journey and been very supportive in regards to um, not, um, you know, casting me out of, of their circle or not feeling like um, comfortable around me. Sure, there, there's times that um, they don't necessarily know what what to say, um, mm. but they're they're very supportive. Family has been, you know, very supportive in in regards um, uh, to it for sure. Not only like my immediate family, with my wife, but my extended family and and uh, you know my mom and my brother and and his family and. Uh, my dad before he passed there was never any I shouldn't say judgment but there was never any looked upon that was any like different as an individual uh, when your question Steve is as an artist um, that is a big big challenge as you leave the corporate world trying to probably one thing that's most misunderstood uh, about me amongst uh, you know my friends even sometimes like um, family um, is trying to convey that um, this is what I am now in life. I'm an artist, right? Um, uh, I do, you know, up until I go to school, I do work on the, on the side to, to help um, substitute, you know, doing art and bringing in some extra income and, um, 
you know, whenever we get together with friends or if you're with family, everyone says like, how's work going? And work means what's your job doing that you bring in the most sort of amount of, of income, right? Um, um, and so working on that to sort of try and be like, hey, that, that's not me. That's just something that brings in some funds for me to allow to do this, but this is who I am. This is how I identify myself, an artist or a photographer. So um, when we talk about work, you know, I want to be, you know, I, as an individual, I want to be asked, yeah, work, how is your art going? You know, how yeah. are any exhibitions coming along? How is any sales of photography? How is your, your site? So um, there's little tricks around that, you know, sometimes I just change the subject very quickly to, you know, try and do, get it on that conversation. Um, I'm sure now that a lot of my friends see that I go back to school, they'll start, you know, you know, portraying in that, or it'll maybe be a little bit different as you come out, because now it'll be like, now, you know, how's school going? Now you're a student again, right? So then when you come out and you're fresh, then whatever you're doing is like more related um, to that. But yeah, it's probably the biggest misunderstanding of, you know, not misunderstanding, but yeah, misunderstanding about me that people don't, don't realize that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I find uh, a lot of my, or no, I shouldn't say a lot of my friends, but some of my friends don't really view art as a real job. They view it as more of a, a fun thing. And it's, uh, right. it's kind of hard to get them to understand that it's my business. It's what I do. And uh, right. yeah. So. Yeah, it, it, I, I remember having when I was doing my, conversation with Silk and Lauman in the panel about like mental health and art um, you know and, and trying to really say that you know um, as an artist even if you're just like you, even if someone is just creating if someone is just creating as an artist just to even you know uh, give things away and that's their passion even if they're a philanthropist type artist that does everything for you know uh, donations um, you're not yeah you can still say that you're like an artist right your other thing that you do like doesn't have to be it's just something that that says how many how many musicians over time right probably famous musicians right like performed in in bars and to get their start and then on the side were like waiting tables at a restaurant or whatever doing an odd job right if you look back at all that and none of them would identify themselves that as I was a bus boy or I was a waiter, they identified I was a musician, right? So um, mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, really important for, you know, for, you know, any level of artist, just to, if you want to identify yourself as an artist, then, you know, identify yourself as long as you're putting, you know, good into the, good into the world, for sure. All right. Yeah. yeah, it's important to acknowledge that we all approach being an artist in our own way. Um, mm -hmm. And like for me, I do give a lot of work away, but it's not the stuff that I create, you know, that's um, near and dear to my heart. It's usually little pieces that I've made um, to do a quick social paint class, teach other people how to do a painting in two hours. <laughs> yeah. So those things don't have as much meaning to me, but sometimes they might have meaning to somebody who's raising money in a charitable auction. Yeah. And then also like the pricing of your art too, right? That's a challenge. So um, I've had people come up to me and say, your, your art is too low, your art is too high. Well, you know, so how do you price your art? Yeah, for the, the, the stuff that I, that I price, um, a lot of it I just sort of do on sort of feel and what I think it, it, it might be, be worth. Um, um, you know, I don't necessarily break it down in regards to this is how much time I put into it, or this is what it would like cost me if I was working on it based on hourly. It's just sort of, you know, what I do, I, you know, and I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty firm um, to it. Um, you know, uh, I definitely, if I'm pricing something and it's an original and I'm giving it away, it'll definitely be more uh, priced higher than if I'm doing a print, um, you know, prints I generally, you know, uh, come up with sort of what it's going to cost me to print it and then on top of that what I think it's going to be um, valued at 
uh, anything that I do sort of like donational wise. So even like when I do a piece for the Terry Fox and, you know, they've been very good, it'll go into like a bid or an auction. I will still put a minimum on it, um, you know, what it has to. So, you know, if I'm putting something up, I'll, you know, I'll say, you know, um, it's minimum 75 to be in the bid. Like I'm not going to just put it there that someone can, uh, you know, bid $10 on it to, to get that particular piece, especially if it's like raising funds. So I'll still even sort of give myself a minimum um, uh, that way. But yeah, I've had the same thing. I've had some people say like, oh, this is too low or this is too high. I remember last year I was working on a, on a project where I was uh, doing um, like portrait pieces of things around representing like social issues and you know, I did a series of, it would be like five, five teens type idea. And then there was five and in, four individuals plus myself. So people that I knew personally that were within sort of my own age uh, demographic that represented uh, different things. And so uh, my buddy from out West who does um, like more like fine drawing art, um, his name's Curtis. I'd done a piece in that and he was actually representing um, um empowering females he works in an industry and he did you know was very much involved in empowering uh females and equality and that and education and then work and stuff and so it was this piece that was done and you know part of it was very realistic and skin color tones and then half of his his face was done in um you know greens and purples and light blues representing sort of that and his wife came to me and said like i'd like to buy this piece for curtis for for Christmas and I can't remember what it was something like a uh, 11 by 14 ink marker base and um, I remember going back to her and saying okay well you know originals around this and I, I sell for a hundred bucks but like I know you saw I'll do it for you know 75 and I'll look after getting it out there to you like it's a gift or whatever and she came back to me and said no like I want to pay a hundred for you like don't devalue your your art if this is what what you uh what you do right so um yeah that's nice that she came back to you and said no 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 yeah give me yeah, the yeah. full amount yeah yeah for sure for sure steve do you have any tips on pricing art you know i get to ask that a lot and it's a very personal subject to every artist uh, i can't tell you what your art is valued you have to be happy with what you price it at and what you're willing to let it go for. Um, myself, I myself have a square inch price because I have to be consistent with my work um, regardless of what size it is. Um, I've got collectors and if they ever saw a piece of mine out there a lot cheaper, the same size, they would be questioning why they invested in my work. So I have to be consistent with my, my pricing and I use a square inch price. And I know a few artists do use square inch prices, but that's just the way I do it. And it's a personal thing for every artist. Yeah, yeah that's about the same answer I've gotten every time I've asked somebody that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's hard. You can't ask somebody how much is my work worth? You know, it, it's personal, so. Yeah, people will come and offer their opinion, right? Yeah, the people, the people that come to you and say you're overpriced or you're underpriced compared to what, you know, it, right. you've got to ask them, what, it, what are you comparing me to? This is what I charge. This is what I'm comfortable with. You know, it's my work. You don't ask a plumber to um, charge $20 an hour if they're normally charging 65, right? So yeah, that's a bit of an issue in the art world, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, I think I always look at. Yeah. I think I always look at it, Steve too, right? It is like, um, you know, you price it at what you're comfortable with or what your strategy is, and mm -hmm. um, it's up to that individual if they they want to, you know, spend um, their money on on doing it, if that's important to them, right? You know, some people yeah. will find, you know, I, I find that too as an artist too, right? There's a lot of times when you know we'll go to to sell things, and it's like, oh, you have like tons of people like a piece that you've done um, and then you put it up for sale and you have no interest <laughs> in it right um right. and that's sometimes because people that yeah. like like your art but when it comes to value from a purchasing standpoint that's not something that's in 
um, you know, like necessarily on their priority priority list type idea, right? And, uh, right. But I think, yeah, you got to stand stead, steadfast with that, right? You don't you don't see a company like Canada Goose saying like, okay, well, you don't think, you know, our winter park is worth $600. So you want to spend 300 for it, we're going to give it to you for 300, right? That's what that particular company values their product. And so it shouldn't be any different than, than an artist, yeah. for sure. Yeah, I mean, you've got your fine art buyers and then you've got the people that only want the prints. Yeah. The people that want the prints, they're the ones that have, you know, one out of 64,000, which is fine if they're happy with that and they're, you know, they're very comfortable with it. That's great. But the yeah. fine art buyers, they want the one of a kind, the original, and they don't have a problem paying for it. So, yeah, for sure. Do you have any other place your art can be seen other than on your Instagram site or? Yeah, no, right now it's just, uh, it is just my Instagram site. I've, uh, I've thought a couple times about doing, um, you know, a website and, and doing that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. It's not my like stronghold to, to uh, do to keep those things um, up. I, I have had like artists or people within, within um, you know, the industry that I know that have said, hey, like that's sort of your next step. If you sort of really want to, you know, see where your art can can go, it's sort of time to, to start doing that. And um, Instagram, again, is, isn't the greatest place like to try and to, to sell pieces, right? Because Instagram becomes very much of, uh, um, you know, uh, a like or dislike just looking at something. And so a lot of times people won't even know that it is for sale, right? Because they don't even like read the post that's uh, right. attached yeah. to it, right? So yeah, that would be, you know, sort of um, the next step. I'm excited with returning to, to school because a couple of courses in there are, are about, you know, sort of creating that that business aspect side of it. And um, I think that's the one thing that sort of, you know, holds, like holds me back. I, you know, going to that next step is, um, doesn't have to be successful in regards to if you do it, making a lot of money off of it necessarily, but you still want to be successful that it, you know, is, is professional and it, it, it still draws people to it type ideas. So yeah, hopefully that's coming down in the, in the near future. And, you know, again, right. Haven't, haven't, haven't done art for, you know, 25 years. And then within sort of the last two years, just sort of, you know, pick it up. Um, again, it's always interesting because some people will say like, when I, you know, did a couple of classes like uh, recently with DBSA, like at a couple of instructors that would be like, are you sure you haven't like done any artwork in like the last like 25, 26 years? Like, you know, they, um, but just sort of, you know, lucky that way that just able to pick it up and like sort of, like sort of riding a bike, right? I just sort of never, never went away and actually if you you know if you look back at my pieces from 18 months ago compared to what they are are now or even probably Rian and Rhiannon um really yeah. when we did the, the the pen pal conversations right I, I told you that I said I'm just yeah. so like happy that we met when you when we did because I got to watch this like stage of growth yeah 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 sort of like yeah like like changes and go with something and uh, experiment a, a long type idea for sure. Yeah. Right? And then the last piece that the one um, you drew a male with longer hair. Yeah. And then you put a photo that you had taken earlier in the day and I knew what it was. Um, you right. didn't come to the artist chat that time. So, but everybody was like, no. what is that? And I'm like, I know I follow his right. Instagram. That was plants yes. on his porch or something. And yeah, then you it was overlaid actually, yeah. it. And just the, yeah. and I sent that to you, Steve. I yeah. sent that image to you. That was the one of his. Oh, right. Yeah. Yep. Isn't that cool? That's a cool one. It is. Yeah. 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 So that's so a combination. Yeah, that's, yeah. So that's actually, yeah. I just, I did the original piece of which is like on Bristol of a, a drawing with like charcoal and ink marker and photographed that and then photographed uh, some, like saw a garden outside and then just took the two pieces and, um, um, overlaid them on one another so I mean that would never be able to be something that was sold as like um, you know um, like an original like original right it'd have to be an original type print type idea um, but uh, yeah you mix the two of them together I actually got that idea I was in a photography class and there we were uh, studying um, this uh, um, photographer Uta Barth from Germany and uh, her 
um, understanding of light. And she did a series on light and she spent something like 10 years where she did this series where all these photographs were just taken within her house and she was understanding how light impacted coming through. And one of our challenges was that we had to take pictures for that week within the room that we took our class from. And the room that I take my class from is like this like record room that I have in the basement, but it has like no natural light that comes into it except one little window. And every day I was trying to take pictures, we had like no real good natural light that week. And uh, I wound up getting one day and, and I had a, a picture of uh, Kurt Cobain in a large poster black and white that I snapped with the a light reflecting on it. And then across the room, I had one with um, Run DMC and the Beastie Boys and I snapped that and I was like, what can I do that's interesting with this? And I was fooling around and I overlaid them over top of one another so that like it was, uh, Kurt Cobain was like a little bit more stronger. And then you saw like the Beastie Boys and Run DMC and they were overlaid in one another. And I was like, ah. Oh. And so I posted this picture and I tagged her in it just as a study of this, this thing. And um, yeah, she like responded back to it. And, um, and it was actually her. Sometimes you're like, oh, I wonder if that's really them, right? And then you, it was her and, you know, a little comment, like, you know, about using the light and joking about being in a lot of like functions and stuff, but never with like all these individuals together. But it sort of got me on that thing of, oh, how can I like um, overlay some stuff together, but still create it pretty natural, right? Because again, when I go into photo editing, I'm, I'm not an individual that wants to take away from what the um, emotion or uh, image was at the time, right? I'm never going to want to be, you know, if we're talking like, say, landscapes like you have in, in, uh, in the background that you've done, Steve, right? Like, I'd never want to be that photographer that takes a, I want to take a picture and capture the moment of that landscape of how it is. I don't want to take it and it be a cloudy day and then go into Photoshop yeah. and make the sky brilliant blue and the water like crystal blue if it's not, right? If it's a overcast yeah. day, what's the emotion that you connect on that, right? But I still think there's ways to overlay pieces and still keep them somewhat natural looking, um, but still have a artistic component to it for sure. Right. Yeah. Do you want to share your Instagram site with the, the listeners? Yeah, sure. Um, it's uh, at fine art uh, underscore projects and uh, name Stephen Ray. So you can, you can find me, find me there. Um, you know, mm -hmm. might look to see something now that I'm um, going back to school that will, you know, that one's a, primarily a lot of art. I do put a few personal things on there, um, but you'll probably see it change over to where I just have a site that feeds off of that. That's just my artwork specifically and, and my personal stuff a little bit uh, separate okay. from that. But yeah, yeah, you can see it there. And, um, you know, I've had some people come through that so you can reach out to me like for a uh, commission piece if you want or if you see something on there um, again like when you're starting out I don't have a tendency to run you know a ton ton of prints and be you know sitting on them I usually like uh, to order type idea um, but yeah. yeah feel free to feel free to reach out and contact me great okay um, I have one last question for you. Uh, Stephen, sure. do you have any more questions for Stephen before I ask this one? No, I'm good. Thanks. You're good. Okay. Yeah. I'm waiting to hear yours. <laughs> okay. So, um, I want it. Well, it's a two parter. Sure. Um, do you have any advice for someone who suspects they may have adult ADHD? And the second part is, um, do you have any advice for somebody who is in the corporate world who wants to be an artist? Sure. Um, so I think if you're an adult um, and you suspect, you know, ADHD, um, I think, you know, the biggest advice I can give um, to someone is, you know, seek, 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 if you're in counseling or therapy, seek, seek someone out that is on the cognitive side. So there are different types of therapists. And I, I found that to be totally beneficial going from just a standard counseling therapist to someone that had a cognitive background they just approached it um, a different a different way I think too if you're you know suspecting those things as an adult you know you know going through it don't be scared of it if anything embrace it um, you know embrace those sort of things the the 
the things that it, it, it can bring to your, you know, bring to your life. I think sometimes people get caught up in regards to, you know, how am I going to be viewed or, you know, how am I going to look back on, on life, um, type idea, um, in regards, but in regards to say like, embrace it, right. I still look at it, right. I thought, oh, I'm in my mid, mid forties. This is really beneficial, but hey, yeah, if I live as long as my dad and like 91, like I still have another 45 years on this earth, right. Why not? No. And, um, you know, through it all, uh, you know, you know, I heard like a lot of, you know, artists that, um, uh, photographers that hey, didn't take it take things up till they were in their 50s or 60s right so um yeah just em embrace it don't be scared of it um, um and it's a great it's a great tool to have especially if you're an artistic type person and sometimes too just knowing it can can help you find um you know a path in regards to might not be an artistic career but it could be just something that's more suited um to you for for sure um, and then the second question for, you know, someone that is in the corporate world and looking to leave to go um, to the arts. Um, yeah, I, I would say, you know, follow your passion and doing, I think your biggest thing that you have to do when, when doing that is, um, it's hard, but for me in order to go down this path, I really just had to take the financial component out of it in regards to financial in regards to what salary and, and, and wage could be and understand, um, you know, does the art outweigh the happiness of, of, of the money, right? I, I can, I can still, I can still live a life on, on totally different. And, and yeah. And like, don't get me wrong. It's, it's a, it's a big thing. When I walked away from the corporate, I was walking away being a long time, like, you know, big box retail close to like, you know, six figures with bonus type idea to, you know, now, you know, could be $40,000 a, a year. Right. But if it's truly what your passion is, um, you know, I think you, you follow it and, and do it. Um, um, and I just came to the realization that, um, you know, um, the, the corporate world didn't give me the freedom to express that what I what I wanted to, wanted to do. I'm much able, much more able to be expressive as a, as an individual rather than you know tag a corporate corporate line. Right when I was in the corporate world, I was at a manager level. Right, I had to you know toe a line to a certain extent. I had to be um, you know conscious and a and a, aware of. Um, morale that I was trying to keep amongst a, a team, even if I didn't necessarily agree with something. I still think um, if you don't agree with something, there's, you know, a professional way to do it. And there's, a, um, you know, one individual that I sort of, you know, look to is, uh, you know, James Baldwin, right? The American writer and poet and, and debater, right? Like, he was so passionate about so many things in life. But if you watch any of his debates even though there was a lot of you know systemic racism around like his life and you know being a black individual and being part of the lbgtq community he he still approached his debates very intellectually and with um um debated like very well and still showed um you know compassion within them rather than being a hateful um individual right so you still need to express it in a in a, in a certain way um for sure. But yeah, that's the biggest thing I would say, like leaving, yeah, leaving the corporate for, for the art, but don't also be, don't be um, afraid that like, you know, I, you know, I'm not involved in the corporate world from the standpoint that I used to, but I, I mean, I still work within the corporate, you know, world from a standpoint of, um, you know, making a pay, making a paycheck and some money. Right. So you, you can still be in, involved, um, in it and there's still some maybe benefits uh, uh to it and you you know use it for what you need at the at the time but you know i know come the end of the end of the summer that that that's gone for me like fully it's totally to the archetype mm -hmm. side of the the world and i just know that'll just bring me much more peace and happiness as an individual so i'm i'm content to to do that rather than look at the monetary value money value of it over the personal happiness of it for sure that's inspiring. No. Yeah. yeah.
Okay. Uh, does do you have anything else to add before we end this thing? Yeah, I just wanted to say, like, uh, you know, thanks for having me on. It was very uh, nice meeting you, uh, Steve, as well. Um, um, thank you guys too for being um, um, both insightful but very open in, in in the conversation. I mean, when I think of mental health and um, advocacy around it, whether it's in the arts or anything else. Uh, these are the, you know, these are the tools that um, allow mental health and conversations around ADHD to be in the forefront, right? Um, there's things that are talked about all the time. There's things that are very um, open and feel um, comfortable um, doing. And there are things that you guys are sort of doing, you know, 365 days of the year, right? Again, sort of me goes back to the corporate world, right? It, you know, nothing wrong against it. It's great that, you know, I'll say the company that you have Bell Let's Talk and Bell does her thing about, you know, mental health day, right? But that's one day a year, right? And it needs to be 365 days a year, not just one day and, and you know, a couple slogans and stuff, right? It needs to be there all the time. And it's these grassroots things that make that possible for sure. Yeah. yeah. And thank you, Steve, for joining me as co-host today. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And, and Steve, thank you for sharing your story and your art with us. My pleasure. I'll leave you now with the beautiful musical soundings from Carly Dalton. Uh, the intro music for this podcast was played on the Rav Fast Drum by Carly Dalton. Carly is an illustrator, a musician, and a writer. By sharing her music and her artwork with the world, she is aiming towards building deeper connections within communities and with the beautiful nature that we are all surrounded by. Feel free to check her out on uh, Instagram at earthwalker, that's earth with a double A, walker, and on her Etsy shop page at earthwalker, spelled with one A, cards. And thank you so much for listening.